good morning. My name is Cassidy Hastings. I'm one of the pastors here, and I will be finishing up our two-week series called The Beauty of God's Grace. Um, and then, as Pastor Jonathan mentioned, next week we're going to be starting in the book of First John. And so we're really excited not only to start a new series, to start a new year, but to be able to gather in person and see people uh, actually not through a screen um, or preach to a camera. Uh, it's going to be great. We're l- really looking forward to that. But um, congratulations to everybody. We made it to 2021, um, and I don't know about you, but uh, when, when the clock struck midnight, um, I went to bed, but then the next morning I woke up, and I was just super relieved and just really excited about um, starting this new year. I know it's not like, you know, going to be a perfect year by any means um, or anything like that, but just kind of having this sense of a fresh Uh, exciting start to a new year, and I think especially after a year that was as hard and difficult, or as Pastor Glenn says, as horrible as 2020 was. Um, But I I, kind of find that to be the case a lot of times where something that uh, is challenging or painful uh, can either extinguish joy and anticipation, or it can amplify it. And for me, I feel like that's kind of what has happened for 2021, uh, is just kind of this, this amplification of joy and excitement, kind of looking forward to this new year. And I don't think that that would have been as dramatic if 2020 had not been as difficult as it was. But oftentimes something that's painful or hard or challenging um, can, can do that. It can kind of bolster, it can amplify that sense of enjoyment and excitement. And I was, as I was kind of thinking through this, um, I, uh, I thought back to at the end of October, my wife and sister-in-law, uh, the three of us, we decided to hike Mount Talac. And so Mount Talac, for those of you who may not be familiar, what? Talic. No, it's not Talac. Um, it's, is it really? No. Okay, I was like, <laughs> it's not. Uh, so we, <laughs> now I'm thrown. Uh, so we decided to hike Mount Talac. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the area, that's up at Lake Tahoe, and it's in the southwest corner of the lake. Um, and uh, it is quite the hike. It is actually 10.9 miles uh, round trip. It is 3,300 feet of elevation gain. Um, when you look at the elevation profile, it basically just goes up the entire time. Um, and you're going across the shale and, and all of this. Um, and, and the summit of Talac is 9,700 feet. It's over 9,700 feet, so it's really far up there. Um, and it is, it is not an easy hike. It took us uh, quite a while. We took a, quite a number of breaks on the way up um, and everything. But uh, once we got to the top, like, it was phenomenal. Like, you were able to see not just the whole lake, but you were able to look down and see Emerald Bay with uh, the island there in the middle of it. It was just absolutely breathtaking. The day that we hiked it uh, was absolutely gorgeous. There weren't clouds. Um, and there was like a wind going over the lake that was causing it to look swirly, and I mean, it was just absolutely gorgeous. Um, So we hiked back down, and um, we're already talking about, even as hard as it was, when we can go back and what we can do, uh, when we can do that hike again. But I think the challenge of that hike amplified the experience of seeing the view, and not just seeing the view, but wanting to share that, uh, to do that again and to share that with others. I would encourage you, if you uh, are healthy enough to do it, to, to try to tackle that. It is absolutely incredible. But again, the, the tough hike, coupled with the beauty of the view at the top, really amplified the experience. If it had just been kind of like this l- little short hike, it might have been great. But just kind of having to go through all of that to get to the view was really amazing. And that's what we're going to see today, that confession, as we saw last week, is a hard thing. It can be like a hike sometimes. It can be not the fun part. But when we do that, when we do that coupled with understanding the beauty of God's grace, and we understand the, the depth of our neediness of Him, and then His generosity, His grace, His mercy extended towards us, then there's, there's this gap in the middle that amplifies the beauty of that grace, and we want to live in response to it. And so the, kind of the big idea of the message this morning is that when we grasp the beauty of God's grace, our words and our lives declare His glory. We live in response to that grace in a way that declare His glory through our words and through our actions. Last week, as I mentioned, and as uh, Jeff 
uh, referred to. We looked at the first 12 verses of Psalm 51. And again, this, this psalm is written as a response by David to his sin with Bathsheba and just his recognition that he has uh, transgressed, he has sinned against a holy God. And so he writes this and he's asking for spiritual restoration. And the big idea of last week's message was that confession is necessary to grasp the beauty of God's grace. Without the idea of confession, without our understanding of our need, we kind of go through life kind of with this like mediocre understanding of who God is and what he's done for us. But when we confess our sin, when we acknowledge that we can't fix our own mess, when we acknowledge that we need spiritual restoration, God's grace is amplified. And we get to live in response to that. And that's what we're going to see David continue to say in today's passage. And the first thing that we see is David desired to share God's grace with others. He desired to share this not just for himself, but to share it with others. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. So David, again, in this first part, he's saying, I have messed up, and I need uh, I need that spiritual restoration. He's throwing himself at the righteous um, but merciful and gracious feet of his creator. But then he's already anticipating God answering that prayer and showing him that grace, and he's envisioning what that's going to look like, and that's going to look like him telling others about it. Biblical confession doesn't lead to this beating of ourselves up over and over. It leads to magnification of God's grace. And when we understand the beauty of God's grace, we're compelled, we're, we just have this overflow of wanting to tell others about it. If grace doesn't taste that sweet to you, then you're just kind of going to be like, yeah, it's another thing that I have. You know, I've got like, I've got my soccer schedule with my kids, I've got, you know, all these extracurricular activities, I've got all of these different things, I've got work, I've got my friends, and yeah, I've got t God's grace tacked on over here. But if you understand the beauty of God's grace in light of our need for it, it becomes part of an overflow that you want to share with others. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Now David had a reputation for very extravagant public worship, and I wanted to look at one example of that uh, in 2 Samuel 6. And uh, in the context of this, um, the Philistines had captured the Ark of the Covenant, and uh, so David had taken the armies, and he had gone to, um, to fight them, and they had won, and so they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant, which represented, it uh, kind of was for Israel, the, the presence of God. They were bringing that back to Jerusalem, and listen to some of how David responded to this. This is in 2 Samuel six fourteen through 19. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw David, King David, leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought the ark of the Lord and set it to, in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed among the people and the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins to each one. Then they all departed each to his house. So this is a guy who, when he saw God's deliverance, when he saw God's faithfulness, when he saw God's grace and mercy, and God showed up in a big way for Israel, like he went all out. It wasn't just like a ho-hum, hmm, it's all right. But he did this not just in a big way, but he did it publicly. He did this before everyone. And just like this, David in, in our passage this morning is anticipating God's answer to his prayer, that God is going to spiritually restore him, and he's already seeing, man, when I think about God's grace, when I think about how God has forgiven me, I want to share that with others. And he wants to do that through all of these different things. And, and Pastor Jonathan, this past Monday, if you haven't seen it yet, go on our YouTube channel, uh, just scroll down a little bit on our 
YouTube channel, and you'll be able to see um, he did a video on nine ways that we can express or we can respond to God in our worship gatherings. He listed nine different ways that we can do that, and David is exhibiting a lot of those uh, in, in the passage in 2 Samuel. Things like playing instruments and dancing and shouting and giving sacrificially. He's giving out. like He's like, man, God is so good. I just want to give stuff to everybody. I want to shout it. I want to dance. I want to sing. I want to do all of these things. And that's, again, because David has this relationship with his creator where he understands when God shows up, there's a response that he wants to do, and he wants to share that with others and not just keep it to himself. And that's because spiritual restoration is meant to be shared. Spiritual restoration is meant to be shared. In 1725, there was a guy that was born, and he grew up in a, in a home, and then as he grew and he was, uh, found some, some work, he ended up working on a slave ship. And then he actually worked on many different slave ships throughout his career, and one of those slave ships was called the Greyhound. One night in 1748, that ship began to take on water. One of the crew members was lost, and it looked like the entire ship was going to go down. And yet God delivered this man. He survived, and he eventually became a pastor. And in 1779, he wrote a song that maybe you've heard of called Amazing Grace. His name's John Newton. And despite his dark past, despite his blindness to God's grace, he wrote this public declaration of the beauty of God's grace in the midst of his darkest life. John's Newton, John Newton's spiritual restoration wasn't just for himself. He, it was meant to be shared, and he shared that through a hymn that he wrote and through giving his life to help others see the beauty of that grace. Now, all of us probably aren't going to write a hymn that will be sung uh, centuries later. Maybe some of us might, so um, if that's you, go for it. Uh, but spiritual restoration isn't just meant to be something that we hold on to for ourselves and makes us feel good. It's not just for us. It's meant to be shared. And that's because worship isn't a private act. It's also meant to be a public declaration. We are created by God, to share whatever captures our heart. And for some of us, that might be sports or politics or products or entertainment or um, money or different things like that. And have you ever noticed that if you're kind of slightly interested in something, you can kind of go along with it for a little bit? Like you're like, yay, that's good. Um, but really, you always kind of go back to like whatever your heart is captured by. And this is what's so powerful about God's grace. Because when we understand the beauty of it, that it's not just something that we tack on, but it, the, the actual overwhelming beauty of it, our hearts become more and more captured with the beauty of his grace. And we live in response to that, and we want to tell others about the amazingness of this. We want to share it, not just with our actions, but with our words. And that's what, Paul, or that's what uh, David here is doing. My tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. My mouth will declare your praise. I will teach transgressors your ways. So he's talking about this. But some, for some reason, I think in the church, sometimes we've made this unintentional war between words and actions. And so we kind of say, well, I'm not going to really, I'm going to just show Jesus, but I'm not really going to talk about him. But then other people say, well, if you don't really talk about him, your, your actions are hollow. And, and I think sometimes what can happen when we kind of have this back and forth on this is I, I picture it like a scale, like a, you know, one of those balancing scales. Um, and on one side you have actions, one side you have words. And so you put a little weight on this side and you're like, okay, here's some actions. I'm just going to do that. And then here's some words. And then once it kind of starts tipping one way, you're like, oh, I got to throw some more actions in, or I got to do more words or, or different things like that. But what happens in those instances is our, sh our focus shifts to how we're doing. Our focus shifts to what the scale is and where we need to try harder and what we need to do more of. But if the focus is on the scale and what we need to do, it's not on the beauty of the grace that has been shown to us. And what happens is when we put our beauty or when we put our focus on the beauty of God's grace, those things, that, that competition kind of dissipates. And it just becomes an overflow of who we are. And so we're not always asking like, 
well, do I need to act more? Do I need to say more? But it just becomes like, I can't help it. David is in this position right now where he's in this passage where he's like, I, I can't help it. It's just going to overflow. I'm going to have to tell people about your grace. So some questions for us this morning. Is your worship a private act only? Or is it also a public declaration? Is worship something that you have to like squeeze out of yourself like you're wringing out the last little drop of water out of a washcloth? Or is it something that you're regularly overflowing with? Why do you serve? Is it because there's a great need? Or is it because you're living your life in response to God's grace? Why do you tell other people about Jesus? Is it because that's what you're supposed to do? Is it just an obligation because that's what Christians are supposed to do? I'm I'm supposed to tell others about Jesus, so I'm going to do it. Or is it because you've really understood the beauty of God's grace and you have no other option but to say, man, can I share with you what Jesus has done for me? Like David, when we truly grasp the beauty of God's grace, we want to share it with others. But even in his worship, he doesn't forget the need for continued humility. David committed to walk in continued humility For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Have you ever noticed that sometimes things that start out well can kind of devolve into habit or just ritual? Good things like worship, can kind of just kind of transfer into, over, over time you can kind of lose the luster and it, it just kind of becomes something that you do and you start kind of having these thoughts of like, I don't really like this song or I don't really want to do this anymore or what's easier for me or what's comfortable or what's more pleasurable. And pretty soon we find ourselves kind of continuing these outward actions but without that internal response. And, and it becomes a habit but our hearts and minds are elsewhere. And this can happen in all kinds of different areas that start out well, like singing or serving or fellowshipping or giving. We can start with a focus on God and then subtly shift into kind of this self-focus where it's like, I, I, I think I'm not really comfortable with this, so I want to do things that are more comfortable for me. David is acknowledging that ritualistic acts are not what God is looking for. He's looking for our hearts. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. God is looking for our hearts. So how can we guard against this kind of slow shift, um, the subtle shift into self-focus, it's through humility. Humility is a right understanding of ourselves in light of the glory of God. And this is why confession is so important, because confession is a reminder to ourselves that we are in need of God's grace, that it's not about us cleaning ourselves up, but we are in desperate need of God's grace. And then when we understand that and we respond in worship, God's grace, God's character, God's actions are magnified even more. And then that's when we start to get this right understanding of ourselves in light of the glory of God. The combination of confession and remembering God's grace is like a fire extinguisher to our pride because we understand that it's not about us that it's not about what we're doing, about the acts that we bring, about what we're bringing to the table. Aligned hearts produce aligned actions. And I think especially at the beginning of a new year like this, it's easy, kind of, we kind of kick into this resolution uh, mindset where we kind of start thinking, okay, well, what went wrong last year? Well, a lot, of went, a lot went wrong last year. But like, what can I change for this next year um, and everything And so we kind of start thinking through, well, I'm going to go to church more, I'm going to read my Bible more, I'm going to work out more, I'm going to eat healthier, I'm going to serve more, I'm going to read more. 
But the solution to spiritual transformation is not to try harder. It's not to find this effort within ourselves. It's to walk in humility, continued humility, and to remember the beauty of the grace of God. Yes, increased effort can lead to changed action. So if you kind of commit yourself to an exercise routine, that can lead to you being healthier. But spiritual transformation comes from understanding God's grace. And God's grace is what truly transforms our words and our actions. It transforms our hearts and our actions. And in 2021, God first and foremost, anybody that's listening to this, myself included, God is looking for our hearts this year. He's looking for our hearts. He doesn't want us to go through the rituals of, yeah, I'm going to church more just to go to church more. He wants our hearts. So maybe God's calling to you, I want your heart this morning. So some questions for us. Think about your day-to-day life. What are you doing and for whom are you doing it? What acts of worship are the easiest for you to kind of devolve into ritualistic habit of just doing it because that's what you're supposed to do? Where are you relying on increased effort for change? And what would it look like instead to rely on God's grace to transform that area? When God's people are living lives of worship in response to his grace and walking in continued humility, they become a corporate witness to the beauty of God's grace. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. As we saw last week, David uh, was the king of Israel, and he understood the ramifications of his sin and what that meant for the whole nation. And he understood if he was in the wrong, then that was going to translate down to how he led his people. But his spiritual restoration that he was asking God for last week didn't just affect him as an individual, it affected the whole nation. And that's because in the Old Testament, when God chose Israel out of all the nations to show his power to the surrounding nations, his power was not shown just in specific individual Israelites living according to how God said. It was seen when the whole nation, the whole corporate group, lived in obedience to him. If they obeyed, he blessed them. And if they, dis- if they disobeyed, he would discipline them. And throughout the Old Testament, whenever it talks about sacrifices being offered, oftentimes it was, it was said that they, it was an aroma to God, that it was an aroma to him whenever they would offer sacrifices because it meant that they were in a right relationship with him. But what happens is when they weren't in a right relationship with him, and, he would diso- and they were disobedient, it didn't smell good. <laughs> and uh, in Leviticus 26, 31, it says, And I will lay your cities to waste. This is talking about Israel when they're disobedient. And I will lay your cities to waste and will make your sanctuaries desolate. And I will not smell your pleasing aromas. So in the passage this morning, and at the end of Psalm 51, when, when David's talking about these offerings being offered as an aroma to God... He's anticipating those being offered in a right way. So he's saying this, when, when we have experienced God's grace, when I am walking correctly, when our people are walking according to God's way, when we're being obedient to him, that the walls of Jerusalem will be built up and the offerings they present will be pleasing to God and a testimony to the world around them. There would be a corporate witness because of this, uh, because of David's confession and because of the beauty of his grace shown to them they would be a witness to the world around them. And likewise, in the New Testament, and even now, we're not just individuals. As I talked about earlier, spiritual restoration isn't just for us to hold on to for ourselves like a warm blanket and say, mm, that makes me feel good. It's meant to be shared. It's meant to be proclaimed. And our sin and spiritual restoration, especially as leaders, affects our corporate witness to the world. When the world looks at the church and doesn't see much of a difference in how we live and treat each other, why would they be interested in what we have to say? When they see ritualistic acts that are devoid of a heart that's humble before God, that's responding in praise to him, why would they want to participate in that? 
But when the world sees a group of people who are quick to confess, who are exploding in heartfelt worship to their Creator, and who are loving one another sacrificially, there's something that piques their curiosity, and they see a difference. As a people of God in the world, we are to be marked by living lives in response to the beauty of God's grace. Our confession, repentance, and spiritual restoration isn't just for our own individual benefit, but it, it affects our corporate witness to the world. And there is this connection between confession and, and grace and response. And so when we confess and we recognize that need that we have, then we start to really understand a little bit better the beauty of God's grace. And when we start understanding the depth of the beauty of that grace, our lives live in response to that. Following Jesus isn't a list about li keeping a list of do's and don'ts and just being good moral people. Following Jesus is about continually responding with our lives, with our words, with our actions, in worship to the one who saved us. When we approach Jesus trying to clean up ourselves, we saw last week, that doesn't work. We end up making a mess on our own. But when we understand the beauty of God's grace that he's shown to us, our need for it, and then how he's shown that to us, we live in an overflow of that in response. As I close this out, I wanted to kind of give an illustration of what this might look like. So in your mind, picture two people, they're each in separate rooms, you can see both of them, uh, and they can see each other through a window in between the rooms, okay? So you look at them and you see that they're sitting there in a chair and you see both of them are, one, uh, both of them are tapping their foot and they're snapping and they're bobbing their head and they're kind of doing the exact same thing. And so from the outside it looks like, hey, they're doing the, the exact same thing, but what happens is as you enter the room, the first room, you go in, and it's just full of music. You, you, see, you hear it going on, and the person is just like really getting into it, and they're you know, snapping their fingers, and, and uh, that, that's the extent of my, my uh, creativity there. I snap my fingers and bob my head. Uh, but, but they're responding to this song. But then when you go into the other room, it's dead quiet. And what the other person is doing, they're just looking through this window at the other person and trying to mimic what they're doing. So they're watching, and they're kind of being like, okay, I kind of see them bobbing their head, I see them tapping their foot, I see them snapping their finger and doing this. So the question is, is there a difference? And at, a, at an initial glance, it might be like, no, they're both kind of doing the same thing. But once you understand a little bit more about what's going on, there's a huge difference because one person is trying to mimic what the other person is doing, where the, whereas the other person is living with their entire body as a response to the music that's going on. And here's the thing about that. God's grace is the song that we live our lives in response to. It's not just about going through the motions. It's not just about tapping our feet or snapping our fingers or bobbing our heads and all these ritualistic acts. It's about living our lives in response to the song that God has sung to us through his grace. So if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, maybe you find yourself just kind of going through the motions. You kind of find yourself in that second person's position where it's like, yeah, I'm kind of just tapping my foot, bobbing my head, but I'm not hearing the music. What is it that helps you hear the music of God's grace? What spiritual disciplines do you need in your life not to try harder, not to try to be a better person, but to tune you back into the song? And maybe you're listening to the, uh, maybe you're a follower of Jesus and, and you're tuned into the song, but you're just kind of enjoying it for yourself. It makes you feel good. My encouragement to you, again, is that spiritual restoration, living in response to this song, is not just for you and your own pleasure and benefit. It is enjoyable for sure, but it's meant to be shared. We are messengers of God's transformative grace in, a, in the midst of a world that is parched for hope 
and looking for hope in all kinds of temporary things. The coming of a vaccine, who's in politics, who's in a particular uh, position of power, where my 401k is, looking for hope in all kinds of different ways. There's so many people that need to hear the song. So who in your life could use, use that kind of good news and stability in 2021, especially after a year that was so hard? How can you grow in your heart for others to hear the music? Here's a great question to really wrestle with and not just to skip past. Who doesn't have access to the song? Who might not ever understand the beauty of God's grace because they, they've never heard it? Who can you share this good news with in 2021? And not just from an obligatory standpoint of like, I'm a Christian, I need to tell you about Jesus, but going up to somebody and saying like, have you heard the song of God's grace? I'm living my life in response to this, and I want you to experience it too. As Pastor Jonathan said in his video, God wants our hearts and our lips, and he's given us that voice, so let's use that voice to sing praises to him and tell others about him. And maybe you're listening to this this morning and, and you haven't committed your life to Jesus. Maybe Jesus is somebody that you kind of know about. Um, he's a good teacher. Maybe even that, you know, he's some kind of spiritual leader uh, and everything. But you haven't really understood what that, what his life, the person and the work of Jesus means for you. My question to you is, have you heard the song of God's grace? Not have you seen people tapping there, or maybe even you have been tapping along or snapping your finger or bobbing your head. But have you grasped the beauty of God's grace in your life? If you want true transformation this year, it's not found in resolutions and trying harder and in individual effort. My encouragement to you, if you want true transformation, spiritual transformation this year, Dive deeper into God's grace. Commit yourself to learning the song a little bit better. Learn the deepening beauty of that song in 2021. And for all of us, no matter what this year holds, I have no idea what this, hold, this year holds, but my prayer is that we would live lives that are characterized by confession, by an understanding of God's character, our need for God's grace, and as a result of understanding our need for God's grace, that we would be a people that live in response to that, not just for ourselves, but in a public declaration where we're sharing in our words and in our actions across the globe the beauty of God's grace. And I, I pray that we would not only hear the song for ourselves, but would see other people be able to sing along. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your grace. I, I know I've said that word 50,000 times over the last two weeks, but it's what it's all about, God. And we just are humbled and grateful that you would show us your grace. And God, I pray for all of us that we would not just go through ritualistic acts in an effort to either gain your favor or try harder, or be better people. God, but may we all just tune, this 2021 would be a year of tuning in to the song of your grace, of what you've shown us, and our need for it, and the beauty of it, and that, God, we would live this year, and all future years, wanting to share that with others. And God, I pray that if there are people listening to this that maybe um, haven't uh, committed their lives to Jesus, God, that, that this would pique their curiosity enough to, to investigate it more. And God, may you be glorified. May your song be heard across the globe where, where it is not yet known. And may we be a people who are committed to loving one another and showing both in our individual lives and in our corporate lives the beauty of your grace. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.